psalm, and yeah, he was looking to the hills, and as I reminded us last week that he was looking to the hills, praise God, not the creation, but he was looking to the creator, praise yeah. God, the one that made the hills, the creator. And so we looking up to the hills, remember one thing, he's looking to the Lord, praise yeah. God, the psalmist is, he knows uh, where his help comes from. Uh, David and all the rest of them, and we do and should know today as believers. But he helped coming from the Lord. He made heaven and earth. He knows everything. He's our creator. He's our sustainer and our protector. In verse 3, he says this, He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. He's not going to slumber. He's not going to sleep. He's there for you. He's always there. Any time of the morning, be up around him. You can't sleep. Oh, Lord, he's there. You don't disturb him, praise God. That's for sure. And his help probably, here's what we're looking at, is the, the way he loves us. Uh, the very things that Jesus died for us, uh, that we might live uh, forevermore. We live with him, the Lord. And behold, he said in verse uh, 3 and 4 there, he says, And for behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. So there's, there's he's, he don't have to get tired. He don't get tired, so he don't have to rest. So, he, you know, he's our God, our Creator, and our Maker. And he will not let you be defeated, praise God. He will guard you because he never sleeps. He who protects Israel never rests or never sleeps. He never gets tired of taking care of us. He never gets tired. You say, well, I've asked you. I've asked you for that over and over. I, I just don't think it's that important. I say again, praise God. Just ask him again and you can know the importance of it. And that the Lord is, is always alert. To protect his people always standing ready and willing to help. And as we talked about and we say, well, why does God allow this like it to Ukraine? And I have to ask God, I, I, I don't know about that. See, we're human beings and what created sin? Yes. What's causing sin? Bottom line, sin. Yes. And so and power hungry and all these things and that's what's created from it. Over in 1 Samuel, we'll, we'll look back over 1 Samuel again and, and just pick up before we kind of left off. I didn't intend to get into that end of that much, but we did and it's really a blessing. I tell you, if you just read it, read the entirety of it, it, it is a blessing. But in this, we, we read last week of, of the very thing of, of Hannah about a husband after all. Elkanah and, and, and all these things here. And we we, we talked about that Hannah's womb, uh, God, uh, shut it up. And you say, why is that? It's to glorify God. There's a purpose and reason for it. And then there was uh, many of the other wife, praise God, she had children, and they was uh, at, at the adversary for it. And she wept, and, and, and she and her husband was concerned about it. We mentioned about it, that when they went to the uh, annual feast there, uh, he would give that wife, he would give her a portion. He would give her children a portion. And But when he came to Hannah, he loved her that he gave her a worthy portion, which is a double portion. He loved her. And, 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 and he said, goes on down, he said, I, I'm better to thee than ten sons. Well, so he loved her, he cared for her and everything. But in her supplication, in her praying, the signal was she wanted, she wanted a son. She wanted a child. And she got down to the point that her husband and all the rest couldn't help, but she knew one that could. And that was God. So she went to the house of God and began to pray. And had a prayer we talked about last week. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord. And of course he got to come out and looked at her and, and, and caught her lips. And he thought she was drunk and threw his wine. And of course she wasn't. And, and then she told him she wasn't a, a daughter of Bilal, she wasn't a bad person, and she wasn't a worthless woman. And so he understood. So he, he told her Eli, and then Eli asked him, said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And this was Eli that had a couple of sons there that they, they were heathen. They were sons of Bilal. I mean, they'd take more of the meat and the, the, the things out, out of the pot from, from the sacrifices than they deserve. Yes. They were late with the women that come to the assembly there. And they, they, brought, they were his two sons. 
But Eli said, And she said, Let thy handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. She had been with God. She had seen God work in her life. Praise God. And, and then it goes on down in verse 19 of 1 Samuel. We read it. Stop me in that. This is just interesting. And he says, And they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord returned uh, and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wasn't that something? God could have did it, but it, there was a process of, of, of having children. And, and this he said, and his wife, praise God. And so, that's the way God establishes one, one, one man in marriage and all these in this right. Praise God, he knew her. He had sexual intercourse. So that put forth that seed, that put that child there, that, that God a lion that opened her womb for that period of time. And he says, Wherefore it came to pass when the time was come about after Hep had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, said, Because I have asked God, uh, uh, asked him of the Lord. And so they was that name. She knew all this. See, no telling what God revealed to her in her praying and seeking the Lord for a purpose. Verse 21, And the man Elkanah in all his house went up to offer up to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. A promise to God. That sacrifice that God deserved from them. But Hannah went not up. But she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned. And then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and thee abide forever. So see that vow that she made, the promise to God says, if you'll give me that baby, if you'll give me a man child, I'll bring him back and I'll give him back to you. And he can serve the Lord all his days. And Elkanah, her husband, said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good, carry until thou hast weaned him. Only the Lord established his word. So the woman abode and gave her son suck until she weaned him. Praise God. See, she weaned him. And back in the day, the Hebrew children, they were weaned uh, usually between two and three years. They were weaned. Uh, uh, and so she had a couple of years plus with this child, but then she knew where the child was going. And, and she meant to keep her vow to God. <clears throat> and that's the way we are. We make a vow. You keep that vow. You make a promise to God. You keep that promise. No, it's bad because you don't want to break that promise. But in his sacrifice that we look at on 24, and when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, uh, with her, with three bullocks and one equal flour and a bottle of wine, and brought him into the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young; he was just a little toddler. You think, be with an old character like Eli, the old prophet. Well, that would be something to take down there and say. Uh, you take care of this. About two or three years old. He read in them two prophets. He, he got them two some going. And, but I'm sure in my thoughts and my opinion that Eli has, has some help. I assure you him being a priest in, in the house of God there. So, but it, she brought the, the, the three bullocks there. And that's for sacrifice and, and all. And one equal flower. And that equal flower, he said, how much flour would that be? Well, it'd be about 20 quarts, but it'd be probably a five-gallon bucket of flour if you just had to think on the measure of flour out. So she brought that, and she brought a, 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 a bottle of wine. Of course, in those days, they had the wine skin, so whatever the wine skin helped, that was the bottle or whatever. She brought him into the house of the Lord in Shiloh, and the child was young. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli, and she said, O oh my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked of him. And therefore also I have lent him to the Lord, as long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. Wait, that's something. That'd take a lot for mother to do that. God gave him. She knew where he come from. 
you very need to go back to the work of the Lord. And you worship the Lord. And, and so that was Hannah about the son, about the sacrifice there, about the books and the flower and the, and the wine and all these things. There's a purpose for everything that we read, everything that we study. And these things come to us and, and, and for a purpose. And it's to grow us and mature us in the things of God. And let us know more about our Lord and Savior. In, in chapter 2, this is her song. This is Hannah uh, praying and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over my enemy because I rejoice in thy salvation. Something to rejoice about. I mean, she had a child there uh, uh, and she was felt like she was a, a fool. She was complete. She felt like all this in her song says, There is none holy as the Lord. For there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. Well, what's something to say? That should be easier for us to say, Christian, as, none, as holy as the Lord. There's none beside thee. You know, he not have any beside him. Neither is there any rock like our God. Psalm, praise God, Psalm. Talk to no more. Talk no more. So exceedingly proud. Let not arrogance come out of my mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge. And by him actions are waiting. He knows. He knows, praise God. And he said, let not arrogance. Boy, that's what they were full of if we're not careful of it. Pride and attitude and arrogance and all this thing, these fleshly things that crop up. And keep it out of, out of distance, praise God from God. Keep our communication broke with God. The things that this flesh conjures up all the way. It means to. But for the Lord is a God of knowledge. He, he, he knows it all. He sees it all. He hears it all. He knows everything. And by Him, actions are weighed. He's the one where the penalty comes from. Where the retribution comes from. And then in verse 4 he says, The bows and the mighty men are broken. And they that stumble are girded with strength. Praise God. That they were full, have hired out themselves for bread. And they that were hungry sheep. So that the barren hath born self. And she that hath many children is white feeble. Praise God. And you see in these verses as we read that they severed and we look at that a little deeper if we get around to it uh, today or another time. But that seven is that completeness. The very thing that you see it so many times in the Word of God. And she that has many children is like evil. Verse 6 he says, The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and he bringeth up. So Lord he places us where he will in the body, body of Christ that pleases him. Not that pleases us. What well, I don't want to be a toad. Yeah, you're a toad. Yeah. Okay, that's all right. You're satisfied. Praise God to the toad. Yes. Every part has need for the other part. People join together, praise God. So we can understand the Lord kill it and make it alive. He bring it down to the grave and bring it up so he's the one who knows when our last day is. We don't. This is that last day that he, we're here, that we're processing through this short time span uh, uh, to heaven. That heavenly city is, is our home. We don't really fit down here. We're just pilgrims. We sojourn and pass it through. Soon be through. Yes. Praise God. I pray everyone in here knows Jesus. That we all can go to heaven. I sit and talk to a fellow here a few weeks ago. I, Run into him and get him and hit him. I said, Old fellow, he was two years older than me. <laughs> so he wasn't old fellow. But praise God, he got to talk to him and asked him, I was there in his place and chickens were running around and different things. And he said, and, and, and he got ready to go and we talked to Ron. Ed's blood lot stacked all up there and everything. And I asked him, I said, You mind the cup for us? And he was like, Stop. He was like, Yeah, good. And we're going to walk away there and the chickens running by and, and all this stuff and we dog out. And uh, we just, I just knelt down there, and he knelt down at the house, just a few feet away. We were getting prayed, prayed for him. Asked him later, I said, are you saved? Are you a man of faith? 
That hung his head and says, no. He says, no. And he says, we can pray for him. And we pray. I pray for him. But he didn't accept Christ then. But I pray to see him out there planted. And I don't know if anybody ever talked to him about the Lord or not. But the old gentleman, and he, he just I run into him at some town. And he got known just a little bit and went out to his place. And uh, it was a blessing. And uh, I pray God do a work in him. The work in him. And that's what it's all about. If we can see, if we can see Jesus, if others can see Jesus in us, then we're all right. We're all right with Christ. Sometimes we fumble the ball and sometimes we get you know, that pride and that arrogance and that attitude drops up and boy, it, uh, it just diffuses everything. But in this, the, the Lord does, He puts down and He brings up. And even we see as kings, we see as presidents, we see God bringing them up and putting them down. And we wonder about this and we're praying for Him there now. Pray God put Him down, you know, get Him out of the way somewhere. But so, you know, we can press on. For somebody that loves God, we need somebody that loves God and loves America and loves freedom and all them things. We don't have it, God. But we did have it. We had it one time. We got a taste of it. And, uh, praise God for it. But he raised up, he put it down for a purpose and reason. And he tells us to pray for the leader we're to pray for. Yes. And the, in verse 7, he says, The Lord make it poor and make it rich. He brings it low and lifts up. He does what he will. We say, well, well you know, he would he'd help everybody have two or three cars. No, no he wouldn't. He'd make it the poor. And that's what Jesus told him. When he, you know, what you see, he said, I'll be gone. But he says, the poor always be with you. And they think they're going to take, make everybody not poor. <laughs> The Lord make it poor and He make it rich and He bring it low and He lift it up and He raises up the poor out of the dust to lift it up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and He has set the world upon them. For He's established. It's all His. It's all His doing. And he does everything good. Everything right. Everything is just. Praise God. To our Lord. And in verse 9 he said he will keep the feet of his saints, and the weakest shall be silent to darkness, for by strength shall no man prevail. He said we'll keep the feet of the saints. He that establishes us, he put us in place, and the weak shall be silent. We praise God in darkness, for by strength shall no man, no man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces out of heaven. Shall he thunder upon them, and the Lord shall judge them. the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king, and exalt the horn of his anointing. Well, that's something. That's you take David, and he was anointed before Saul ever left out, and Saul hunted him and tried to kill him, and all these things for a purpose. And David, God always protects him, always kept him. He kept hungry sometimes, he got thirsty sometimes, he got them, uh, you know, fearful. Praise God, he knew where to go, and he knew who was keeping. And I pray we do today, I pray we know who was keeping us along this journey. And then we'll stop there, but the ministry, if you get time to read on down on, in that, it's such a blessing. You read about Eli and the sons and what happened to them and situations there. And uh, it's. Uh, Awful things to happen about Samuel when God talked to Samuel. He's just a child. He goes in there and talks to Eli. And Eli, I tell him, he stay, stay, stay in there and let him speak to him. And he did. And he said, and Eli told him, he said, tell me all. All that he's told you. And he did. And it wasn't uh, good news, but Eli accepted that he knew that God was always right. Always what he did. In these verses, uh, we look at verse 5 and 6 just a little bit. And the Lord is thy keeper, and the Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. And the sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil, and he shall preserve thy soul. And the Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this, this time forth and even forevermore. So here, uh, the Lord guards you and He keeps you. 
The Lord is the shade and the protection from the sun. Praise God. He's going to protect you. And the sun cannot hurt you during the daytime and the moon cannot hurt you at night. These are things that may come against you. You know, is what he's talking about. And, and so, not be concerned about being taken care of at night and day. Moon and sun. God's going to take care of the Lord. is always the work to protect His own. The shame is that protection from all enemies. Sir. From all enemies, day and night, He protects. So I want us to look over just a little bit at uh, Revelations. And it's kind of a little different there. It's Revelations uh, chapter... Let's see. We find just a minute. And it's over in uh, Revelation chapter 7. I want to pick up with that just a little bit. And we're talking about protection. We're talking about keeping the way God does. And, and we're probably going to uh, uh, read uh, chapter 7 there in Revelation 6. I mean, in chapter 7. Revelation 7. This is a, a place that uh, between six and eight, this kind of a uh, this kind of a pause or prelude uh, for what was taking place. Because the seals was being opened, the fifth seal and the sixth seal, and then we go into chapter seven. But then you go into the eighth chapter. Eight. So this is kind of a pause between those. And, and I want to read that. It, it's uh, it's something that I think is important. It's, it, it's real interesting to, to look at this and to know because you've heard uh, probably a lot of talk about the 144,000 and I've had them come by the house of people that pass it out and stuff and, and try to tell me, you know, how many are going to heaven and they have to be, you know, backwards and not literally born. But here I want to read this and then we'll kind of look at it. But something in this one that, that before we get started, uh, in Revelations, John the Apostle wrote it. God called him to write, to write down these things, what things, these visions that he's going to see. Contains here, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And he is the center of this entire book, Jesus Christ. Is. See, this is the closing out. This is the put aside. This is completion. This is all this that we're talking about. And here, John is a prisoner. He's in the Isle of Patmos there. Uh, for what? For the Word of God. That's what the Scripture says. He's there for the Word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So uh, we want to look at that in just a little bit. But here, John was in the Spirit in chapter 1. When was it on the, in the, on the Lord's day? And he heard a great voice. And, and praise God, that kind of tells me when I read that, that he was there on the aisle. Why? Because he's a prisoner. He was put there to finish out his days, to finish out his time. And John was there. And had a, he heard that great voice. Let me just turn over to uh, just a little bit. A little bit of that. We're, we need to. Over in, in Revelation, in the first chapter, we just put this up. In chapter 1, this is the beginning of the church age, and we're not going to get into all that. But it, 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 this is signified, uh, made known by an angel to John. The Lord gave Jesus Christ the message, the message was given to an angel, and the angel signified it and gave it to John. And he said in one that revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servant things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. <clears throat> Listen to this. Blessed is he that readeth. And they that hear the words of the prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. So if you want to be blessed, a lot of people avoid revelation, you know, because it is very hard to understand. But if you kind of read it with an open mind and an open heart and the Spirit of God teaching you along the way, you can pick up 
coming to this uh, precious thing. And uh, he goes on down there in the salutation of John to the seven churches, basically. And, and we we'll just move along. But we need to hear clearly that he's here for a purpose. And, and that's what he was told to write. He said, write this that you see. And in this in chapter 7, listen to what he says here. And this is talking about the redeem, which is 144,000. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and to sink. And here's what the angel said to him. He said, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees. Listen. Till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Don't do it down. Just wait a little while. We've got to seal those 144,000. We've got to speak to them. Got to give them that seal. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed a hundred and forty-four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Hundred forty-four thousand. Twelve thousand. Twelve tribes. Forty-four thousand. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Gad was sealed twelve thousand. And if the tribe of Asher was sealed 12,000, and of the tribe of Nephilim was sealed 12,000, of the tribe of Manasseh was sealed 12,000, of the tribe of Sidon was sealed 12,000, of the tribe of Levi was sealed 12,000, of the tribe of Ishtar was sealed 12,000, of the tribe of Zebulon was sealed 12,000, of the tribe of Joseph was sealed 12,000, of the tribes of Benjamin was sealed 12,000. Listen, that's important to, for us to know as believers in this thing of closing out because we don't know when it closes out. If you say, well, we've been looking for it for all our life. Our, our life is just drop it to when he make a splash in the order of time. But we thank God that he knows it. And, and you see the multitude of Gentiles that are coming up. We read just a little bit further. We talk just a little bit more about it. But blessed is he that readeth this. At over in chapter 22nd coming of Christ, the millennium. See, you get into all of this that is not Greek either. It's, it's English. It's, it's put to us. And for a thousand years, Satan will be cast into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. It's going to be released for a period of time. Wreak havoc. But listen to this. In the multitude of Gentiles here, there, there are racial groups from various places and people say well is anybody going to be saved through tribulation yeah. the thing about it is us being us a church we won't be in the, uh, the tribulation i mean yeah tribulation or the statement of jacob's trouble sometimes so we will be gone the church will be called out we'll be raptured away we'll be gone but for those that's left here, that's really not, I, 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 I urge anybody that's lost to find Jesus in these days and times. So we don't know where this mess over the Middle East was. We don't know where all this stuff was. I know, I think it was sometimes this morning or yesterday that I ran fire from rockets over in Iraq. And, and then the Chinese leader says, you know, you don't try nothing. You don't keep any way out of those islands over there. Nobody's trying. So what has been threatening going on and what they call sword rattling going on and it's a good time. Is it in the time? I don't know. I don't really think so, but you know, they've always they always fall. God only knows that. But after this, he said, I beheld and lo a great multitude, which no man could number. And all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes palms in their hand. The great multitude cried with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne unto the Lamb. 
And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God. And that's talking about the four and twenty elders. The, you know, these twenty four elders that were there, those four beasts that were there, you, you need to read it and understand. That's what's coming in these days. And he said, Amen. Blessed and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and, and honor. Praise God. And honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered and said unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And which came back. And here's what John said. He said, I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came up of the great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them, and they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any deep. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto the living waters or fountains of water, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Feeding, leading, keeping those, praise God, just mentioned, those that's redeemed, those that come up through the tribulation. And if you read on those that have been killed in the tribulation or died during that period of time, there's going to be some there. You say, well, the spirit of the church has been called out. What's that? God. It's God that can save the animals. I mean, the thing about it. And we thank God that He can. But thank God that we have an opportunity right now because we have breath and we're breathing, praise God, that we can accept the Lord Jesus Christ, be with Him, and go with Him. But he sends forth for when he comes forth. Let's stop. We do that. We want to pray. Thank God. Thank the Lord for you being here today. We just work together with this. Father, we thank you for this precious, precious word. We ask God that you touch each heart and each heart and each family right now. Minister, us to, uh, minister to us right now that we might be ministering to others. We go out and back. Lord, we just want to pray to the Lord. Pray we never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.